All right. How's everybody doing today? It's, uh, it's great to be here with you guys. What a beautiful time in San Francisco. This is actually really good weather for being outside because we're not going to get sunburned. It's really not all that cold. So I hope you guys are fired up to be here. And uh, we did miss a, a very important announcement, and that is it's going to be the Rodriguez wedding this coming Saturday. Gilbert and Alicia will be getting married. It's a great celebration. And uh, I, I want to thank everybody who came out for our NorCal Classic Basketball Tournament. Uh, we had an outstanding time. And uh, as God would have it, San Mateo came home the victor. Uh, Adam does love his new trophy. Uh, when the finals were going on, there was uh, three characters over on the sidelines. Uh, Christian and Ole and Kwaku. I saw them as Cora, Dathan, and Abiram over there with content and rebellion in their heart towards our dear brother Adam, who's just giving his best on the court. But uh, it, it was an awesome, I tell you, that was our best tournament so far. A uh, huge thank you to Kyle Bartholomew, he did an amazing job organizing the whole event. It was an incredible time. We had, we had professional refs there. It was great. Uh, we had a great facility. It, it went smooth. And I can't wait to next year. Uh, you know, I told uh, Cora, Dathan, and Abraham, there's always next year. And so I think that comforted their souls. Uh, but let's get into the Bible together. Amen? Amen. Let's turn over to Colossians chapter 1. Baby. And babe, can you give me my phone? Colossians 1. It's something to hold the page here. We're going to pick it up in verse 3. It says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and the love that sprang from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it's been doing among you since the day you first heard it, understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and also who told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and praise him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom of light of his son he loves in whom we have the redemption and the forgiveness of sins and the church said Amen. you know this is uh, an outstanding scripture and today we're going to really study out colossians chapter one and it goes through a lot of things but it, it, it gives us really the narrative of much of the bible and the narrative of the bible is that there is a god we are his creation and that generation after generation has drifted from God and all the goodness and joy that could be theirs if they would draw near to him. And we see all the ramifications that happen in our lives, in our world, when we drift away from God and eventually we get to a place where we need rescuing. You know, we read about this in Exodus 3, you don't have to turn there. It says, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt 
and I heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and bring them out into a land, a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. You know, God looks down from heaven and he sees and hears all the strife, all the disunity, all the hungry children, all the hurting families, all the wars, all the crimes. He sees it all. And he is concerned about the suffering of mankind. And his heart is that he wants to rescue them. You know, the Bible has referred to the world that we live in in many different ways. It's called the world unholy, unloving, brutal, corrupt, abusive, full of violence. It is the kingdom of the air. It is harassed and helpless. It is diseased and it has a sickness. You know, we turn on the news and we see what's happening today and we are disgusted by the darkness. The world is a place where the first set of brothers, Cain and Abel, Cain killed his brother. It's a place where people sacrificed their children in ancient times to idols hoping to bring prosperity to their lives and their flocks and their herds and their fields. And we have the same thing today. We just call it choice. It's the place where we tortured and killed the innocent creator for doing nothing more than calling us to be righteous and good people. It's a place where people fly planes into buildings hoping to only kill and destroy. It's a place where enchanted youth go into schools hoping to kill the defenseless before they take their own lives. This is not what God wanted for us. There were not school shootings in the Garden of Eden, I can tell you that. God had a different intention. He wanted things to be awesome. And because of us drifting away from God, we've seen all the darkness in our world, and God wants to rescue us. You know, it says in 1 John chapter 5, you don't have to turn there, it says, We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. You know, today I don't want you just to hear with your ears. I really want to call you as a brother, as a friend, as a humanitarian to open your eyes. Open your eyes to the world we live in. I know you can get caught up with the backdrop here and think that we are in a beautiful Bay Area. You Maybe you thought that you woke up this morning in San Francisco or the South Bay or the East Bay. Maybe you bought into that lie, but you woke up this morning in the dominion of darkness and God wants to rescue you from it. And that's the time my lesson for you, rescued from the dominion of darkness. You know, I just have two points for you today. My first point is remember the dominion. Remember where you came from. Let's go back to verse 3. It says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and the love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. And he already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. You know, this scripture tells us so much about what happens when we come into contact with the gospel. Uh, a thing to understand about the book of Colossians, that it's an interesting book. Uh, Paul writes it in prison. And he really gets a, a report from a fellow prisoner, a papyrus, about a church in Colossae, which actually was not a major city. So this would have been more of a rural church. And if you read through the book, you see because of that, Paul really tries to give them a, a, a cosmic view of things. If you go into chapter, in, in verse 15, he, he gives this cosmic view of who Jesus is. And he ends out the chapter that, that every creature under heaven has heard the gospel. Wow. See, because when you're a, a small town people, you could just have your mind on small town things. Wow. And he's trying to get these people to pan out 
and see all that God is doing. But it's a church that Paul had never actually met before. And he's writing to them at the request of Papyrus. And here we read about, in verses 3 through 5, the holy trinity of God's character. Faith, hope, and love. And we read about these things in 1 Corinthians 13, where it says, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. But here, it actually says that the faith and the love came from hope. See, the first virtue of conversion is hope. See, I started to study the Bible. I didn't have faith yet. I was an atheist. I definitely didn't have love in any type of biblical way yet. But what I did have is hope. Y'all yeah. you know, never forget that first Bible study. You know, I studied the Bible with a pretty interesting crew of guys. And they sat down. That's not funny. I studied the Bible with you. But I sat down with these guys and we did a word study and we looked at the Bible needing to be the standard of your life. And we looked at what the Bible says about the Bible. And I, I remember just feeling like, wow, this is amazing. I had no idea you could even read the Bible like that. I, I had no idea that you could understand it so simply yeah. and that you could apply it to your life in such a dynamic way. Yeah. And as I started to study those scriptures and they started to come to life for me, there was a, a thing that happened in my heart. There was a flicker. There was a small flame. And it was the flame of hope. Wow. It was hope that maybe I'd finally found the truth. It was hope that maybe there was actually purpose to my existence. It was hope that, man, I could change. It was hope that the world could change. It was hope that somebody like me could one day become a mighty man of God. Wow. It was hope that I could live a life that would mean something. Yeah. And it was hope that when it was all said and done, that I could go into beyond and be in heaven with God for all eternity. Wow. See, it starts with hope. Yes. You know, you remember that first day when you studied the Bible? 100%. And you saw those like it says here. The gospel of truth and that hope came into your life. You know, I think today we need to remember the darkness that we came from. Yeah, bro. You know, it talks about in Acts 17 that God sets the times and places. Right. Yeah. That he orchestrates the events in your life for that perfect moment. Yeah. That it talks about also in Romans 5 where it says, you see at just the right moment. Yeah. While you were still in your sins, God reaches out for you. Wow. You know, God's timing is incredible. Yeah. As I, I really look back and think about my own life, I, I, I'm amazed, I'm astonished at how effective God was yeah, yeah. in getting me to a place, one of the most unlikely of candidates, to actually hear the Bible and actually be willing to do it. Wow. You know, I, I grew up uh, antagonistic of God and the Bible. I hated the idea of Christianity. I thought that Christianity and church going was for, you know, nerds and geeks and people who didn't know how to have, you know, friends or girlfriends or things like that, you know. And, you know, there's certain characters here like that. Amen. I get that. And, uh,. I thought it was like a crutch for people who needed something in life that life was not providing. And I'm like, I don't need those crutches. I got a life. And that's good for you. I mean, that's good for you. I look down upon it, but that's good that you need something like that. And that's what I thought. And so I was against it. I, I, I didn't want anybody telling me nothing. And then I sat down and studied the Bible, and I realized it was me who had the crutches all along. I had the crutch of needing to get high, not just every day, but most hours of the day. The life and reality was so unbearable that I had to check out from it. The dominion of darkness was so overwhelming that I had to live in an alternative universe. 
You know, that I needed to pour myself into relationships that were meaningless and went nowhere. And I idolized these relationships and thought if I just had them, that somehow I could be happy only to find time and time again that come up empty. And then I saw these men and I saw these women who took a hard look at the truth. And we all love the truth when it's pointed at other people. But they looked at it being pointed at themselves. And they had the guts to accept it and change their life and throw off all those crutches and be heroes. You know, I was a persecutor. You know, our dear brother Femi uh, asked me a little bit of my conversion story on the way to the restroom over here. And uh, I first got introduced to the church because my girlfriend, when I was 16 years old, grew up in the church, though she never became a Christian. And when we were 18, we moved to San Diego from Tampa, Florida. I lived in a little studio apartment downtown San Diego. And while we were out there, she met somebody who had like a mercy shirt on, but for the old movement. Had a Hope, Hope Worldwide shirt on. And she knew that that was the charity arm of the church that she was raised in. And so this, this couple started taking her to church. And I go, I ain't going to no church. Yeah. I let her go one time. The next time they came, we lived in the studio. And so I closed the blinds, locked the door. And I made her get down. I was like, get down, we ain't going. And they're knocking at the door and we're like hiding. Because I want nothing to do with this. I was a persecutor early on. And God was able to come in my life at just the right time wow. when I was finally humbled. And it took a lot. When I was finally humble, I finally came to my wit's end. And some of us were still trying to eke out a life in this world, thinking that somehow it's going to end up like a Hollywood movie. It's not going to end up that way. You know how I know? Let me tell you. Look at your families. It's no Hollywood film. And you think somehow it's going to be different for us that we're going to live out some type of song or movie? It's not going to be a movie or a song. And finally, maybe it's time to put your hope in the right things. You know, we study the Bible with many people, and this is something I really want to encourage you with, that God is doing so much work in those people's lives before you even invite them out to anything. 100%. God has orchestrated so much. I can't tell you how many accounts have we heard of people who get up here when they finally like do a communion in the church or something like that. And they go, hey, or they share their testimony right before they get baptized. And they go, I was praying literally the day before. God, if you're real, show yourself to me. Or God, please show me the real truth. And if there's a real church, show me what it looks like. Sarah prayed a prayer like that right before she got met. Wow. And I know that's many of you because God was setting the times and places for him to come into your life and start to call you out of the dominion of darkness. You know, let's look at the first time the Bible talks about darkness. Turn over to Genesis chapter 1. What do I do? Genesis chapter 1. We're going to go right to the beginning. Let me just overcome the elements here. <laughs> what are they doing in the first century without? All right, let's look here at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. You know, here... We have all the answers to what science has been trying to figure out for about 100 years. It says, in the beginning, there's time. God created the heavens, there's space. And the earth, there's matter. Time, space, and matter. Where did it all come from? God. It was right here in the Bible the whole time. We could have figured it out in five seconds. 
You know, and it's interesting also, there, there are two elements that need to be in play for life to exist. There needs to be light and there needs to be water. And here they're both. And life begins on earth. And this is an amazing count that we call the creation account. But really it is the account of converting to Christianity. Yeah. See, it's emblematic of what happened in each one of our lives. And this is the depth and an incredible nature, the divine nature of the Bible. It says, in the beginning, God... And that's what happened when you first started to go down that narrow road is God got involved in your life. It says that God was just hovering over a formless, empty mass called the earth. And that was your life before you became a disciple. Amen, bro. It was formless and empty. It says it was just a, a big bowl of deep waters. And I, I don't know about you, but that's what I was. I was just a big ball of deep waters. Yeah. It says in Psalm 18, verse 6, He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. Wow. And so this is what God has been doing. This is what the Bible paints a picture of. That the Spirit of God, He's just hovering over the deep waters of your life, watching you make them deeper and darker as we go further and further from Him. And after 18 years, 19 years, 20 years, 25 years, maybe 30 or 40 years, eventually God orchestrates the perfect moment in your life when somebody walked up to you and said, Hey, I love for you to come and study the Bible. Then you sat down. Somebody but he opened up the scriptures and God said those four magical words to you in your life and it was let there be light wow. and then light came into your life it says in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 for God who said let light shine out of darkness made his light shine into our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God displayed in the face of Christ. See, the creation, the conversion account is happening every time we take this, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, and we shine it upon somebody who's in the dominion of darkness. You know, I can never forget that time in my life and how empty and formless my life truly was. And God's done things along the way of my Christianity to help me to remember. I'll never forget back in 2010, you know, I, I, I liked uh, the region leader. She led the region. Her name was Sarah Travis. And, uh, I wanted to date Sarah Travis. One time, no joke, at a congregational service in Los Angeles, uh, Kip called me Jason Travis. It hurt. It hurt a lot. That was after we got married. Of course. Sarah, Sarah was a, a big star when I wanted to date her. And so Kip, he goes, he goes, bro, 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 if, if, bro, if, if you, if you want to date Sarah, you got to go through CR. And if you don't know what CR is, it's chemical recovery. Because I had that in my past. And he wanted to make sure that his daughter in the faith was getting involved with a guy that was going the right way here. And so I went through CR, and if, if you've never been through CR, uh, it, it, it's really digging deep into those dark waters of your past. Yeah. And, uh, and Ryan Caceres was leading CR at the time. So Ryan Caceres was my CR leader, and Nick Bordieri took me through it. And Nick Bordieri is kind of a father in the faith to me, and if you've never done CR, which you, it really centers around writing a journal. And in the journal, you want to write every time you used what happened, what were the consequences, how'd you feel then, and how do you feel now? And through the exhaustive effort of trying to go through every highlight of all the use, 
It helps you connect with why you did it wow. and why you started to go down those paths and what you were running from and what you were trying to overcome or, or hide from. And I was the first one to write the journal with this class. And you kind of know in CR the idea is that you, you need to cry from your journal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're not, we're not going to say it, but you know it. Because <laughs> you want to make a connection to the pain right. and the use. And so I wrote this journal. And you have to write it. You can't write it like a little bit in the morning, a little bit in the afternoon. You have to write it for a box of four hours. And so I sat down and they said, don't go back and read it because then you want to kind of like make it look better. Yeah. It's like, no, no, just write it and close it. And they come and read it at class. And so I followed the directions. And I got to class and I just started reading this journal. And it, 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 it feels like, you know, seasons are changing yeah. when you're reading this in front of everybody. Yeah. And so I'm reading this. I'm almost crying. I'm almost there. But I close it. And I look up for the first time. And then all the brothers share. And then finally, Nick Bordieri shares at the end. And Nick Borieri is like my, the Italian father that my dad wasn't, my dad, he wasn't Italian, always wanted to be. Nick actually is Italian. And he's a father figure to me. And so I just remember with tears in his eyes, he just said, Jason, never forget. Wow. Never forget. And then I started crying. <laughs> And that moment, those words have ring out to me now 12 years later. Never forget. Yeah, bro. You know, today, if, if you have forgotten, God is calling you to remember the dominion of darkness. Judges 8 said, No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. They did not remember their God who rescued them from the hands of all their enemies. See, with drifting with God goes hand in hand with forgetting what he's done. Yeah. And he has called us this morning as God wants to see immeasurably more miracles happen here in San Francisco as a family of disciples of Jesus to remember the dominion of darkness that he rescued you from. And I just have one other point for you today. And that is rescued to become a rescuer. Let's go back to Colossians chapter one. See, Christianity is not something that just happens to you and then that's the end of the equation. It's a pay it forward doctrine. You get rescued, but to become a rescuer. Let's look here in verse six. It says, it has come to you all over the world. This gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it's been doing among you since the day you first heard it, understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and also told us of your love in the Spirit. You know, here it tells us what the first century church was like. It says that it was all over the world. Not just one church, not just a handful of churches, but all the churches around the world in the first century were bearing fruit and growing just like the church in Colossae that Paul had never actually met. You know, there's something about Christianity that God saves us and then it goes right in the natural reaction is to then go and try and save other people. You know, I was reading about David in 1 Samuel and it's kind of interesting. In 1 Samuel 17, David said, I went after talking about the lion and the bear, struck it, rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair and struck it and kill it. 
So here David goes, man, I, I went after the lion. I went after the bear. I struck it. I killed it. I rescued the sheep. Only verses later, he explains the account a little differently. He says, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hands of this Philistine. See, David saw his defeat over the lion and the bear as the rescuing hand of God. The two were meshed together. They were not separated. In the same way, us being rescued by God is meshed together with going out and defeating the forces of darkness and winning and rescuing those in a lost world. The first century church got the job done. Tertullian, who's a second century Christian writer, he says, we are of but yesterday and we already feel your cities your islands your camps your palace senate and forum we have left you only your temple talking about greek mythology and when's the last time you saw a greek mythical temple you don't see those anymore because they eventually got to those temples and they turned them upside down with jesus christ's teachings see they got the job done now it's on us to walk in their footsteps. Let's look in verse 9. It says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and that you may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. You know, this is amazing. And it tells what God wants in our lives. He says, man, I just pray that you guys will be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Now, what is God's will? We know what it is. It's to go and evangelize the world. I know that you know that. But the question is, are you filled with that? Is that what fills your life? Or is that just an afterthought, something that is just a part of your life? A little part of your schedule or is it a, a consuming thing of your life it's why you go to Bible talk it's why you go to midweek it's why you're even here today or why you have those uncomfortable moments where you share your faith and hopefully you got some of those little card flyers and why you're gonna knock on your next-door neighbor's door and want to tell them about something because you're filled with the knowledge of God's will that they need to become sought out disciples of Jesus Christ you know, there's a, a brother that is just so filled with this. And that's our dear brother, Alan Ramos. You know, Alan Ramos, he just came back from Dallas, went on the mission team there, put his schooling on hold, and went over there, had to get, had to get um, residency, started to go to school in Texas, and then came back to the Bay only months ago and since Alan's been back he's been personally fruitful six times he shared his faith with Sheriana who got baptized in San Francisco then he shared his faith with Isaac who got baptized in San Jose Alex in Hayward Edward in Hayward just this last week Noah got baptized in Oakland and today he met Antonio who's gonna get baptized at the end of service because Alan's just filled with the knowledge of the will of God. And I believe he's a special brother. And so I wanted to ask him in front of all of you guys if Alan would become a part-time intern in the San Francisco church. There he is over there. Guys, let's give it up for Alan Ramos. You know, this last week, Sarah and I got to have a, an incredible celebration with the son and daughter in the faith, and that's uh, our, our dear Ole and Regine Oradola. 
and we had kind of an after-the-fact celebration of their soon-to-be appointment as an evangelist and women's ministry leader. And it was a, a wonderful time together, and I'm just so proud of them. But we took some pictures to close out the dinner, and I didn't send the picture to him yet, but Ole just looks so tired. <laughs> And I noticed it when we had the dinner. I was like, is Ole just not fired up? Is he feeling a lot? He's a little scared of this appointment. Is fear starting to creep back in his life, you know? Yeah. But the reality is that Ole was just super tired. And you know why he's so tired? Because that dude pours himself out every day. He still works at Phil's Coffee. He works at the coffee shop leaves that, wakes up at four o'clock in the morning or some crazy thing, goes and, I don't even know he's going to the mall, he's going somewhere. De Anza hasn't been open in like a year and a half, he's going somewhere. He goes somewhere and he shares his faith, he gets all of his disciples to do the same, and because of that, he's at one of the fastest growing ministries. Because they're just filled with the knowledge of the will of God. And because of that, it, it, it was right for Sarah and I to ask them that next year when Kwaku and Ashley go and plant the church in Ghana, Africa, that the Oradolas will become the super region leaders in San Francisco. And I know that there are so many heroes in this crowd today that, it, that the will of God consumes you. And that's why we're going to get through those tunnels here in another month and we're going to plant the final region of the San Francisco church over in Marin County. And that's why at our anniversary service on September 11th, we're gonna plant the Fresno International Christian Church down there. And that's why next year, we're gonna plant another three churches. We're gonna plant Ghana, we're gonna plant Nebraska, and we're gonna plant Wyoming. We're doing four churches in one year. And that's because I'm looking at a, a, a huge crowd of dreamers, of true revolutionaries. They've laid their lives down. They're not just coming here to play church, but they really understand that though this city looks so beautiful, that it's actually a dominion of darkness. And the only hope it has is for the strong arm of the Lord, which is every single one, to go and rescue them. You know, let's close out here in verse 10. All right. Amen, bro. Let's go. We're going to pick it up actually in verse 11. It says, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light, for he has rescued you from the dominion of darkness. You know, it talks about in this part, it says, live a life worthy. Amen. Worthy. You know, we're such Americans that we've turned Christianity almost into like a birthright. Wow. An entitlement. I'm an American. And because of that, I'm entitled to health care. I'm entitled to clean roads and good schools and clean water. I'm an entitled to salvation. Jesus said in Revelation 12 says, to the one who is victorious, I'll give him the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and I sat down on my father's throne. In Matthew 10 verse 38, Jesus said, whoever takes up his cross and follows me is worthy of me. In Ephesians 4, verse 1, it says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live lives worthy of the calling you have received. And here it says the same thing in Colossians. We are called to be more than mere humans. We're called to be superhuman beings that tap into the very power of the Almighty. We can do immeasurably more than we even think we're capable of. And it tells us what a lifestyle that is worthy of God and His sacrifice for us actually looks like in the Scripture. It says, bearing fruit in every good work, 
growing in your knowledge, becoming powerful, great endurance, and just being grateful for what God's done in your life. You know, why should we aspire to live such amazing, worthy lives? Because it says in Psalm 107, that he sent out his word and he healed them and he rescued them from the grave. So when you die, it's not the end, it's the beginning. Because he rescued you from the grave. Psalm 18 says, he rescued me from my powerful enemies, my foes who are too strong for me. The forces of darkness in this world are too strong without God. And so God rescued us from them. And then finally in Psalm 18 also, he brought me into a spacious land. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Nice. God rescued you because he looked down. He saw JP, he saw Jeff Kim, he saw Jesse, he saw Raina. He even saw Adam, and he delighted him. And he said, you know what? I love them, and I'm going to rescue them. You know, in closing out, I remember a discipling time I had many years ago with Tim Kernan. And he sat down with me, and he said, bro, you have a rescuer's complex. And he said, I think because you saw your mom die, and 18 years ago, my mom passed away. And I tried desperately to get my mom to study the Bible and become a disciple. I had her come out to a women's day. And then on one fateful night, my brother called me and told me that she had passed away. Unexpected. And I'll never forget when, she, when we went to the funeral, I saw my mom there. And then the service was over and everybody left. I didn't want to go because I knew that it was over. It was over. That once I left, there was no more hope. It was, it was done. It was final. And finally I left and what Tim told me, he goes, I think going through that, it created you in a rescuer complex that you have pointed at a lot of unhealthy things. I pointed at unhealthy relationships. He says, and now you're, you're trying to even rescue me. And I was trying to rescue Tim because I saw that he was in some deep waters when he came from London. And he goes, hey, bro, you have to learn how to point that complex at a lost world. And I wanna call you to do the same thing that we've been through much in this darkness. We've been through many pains, many hardships, but I wanna challenge you as the very children of God to point all that pain at a lost world and say, I will be one who will go and rescue it because it rescued me from a dominion of darkness. I love you guys very much.